the rest of the lesson he will conduct as per his schedule. We will be blessed to hear him and learn. Kindly write everyone your name so that I can distribute the kit to you, the study material. Okay. Ground rule number one is I cannot teach you what I do not know. So do not say that I have read in his book. I may not be knowing that. And teach me something about that. The second ground rule is that I am not going to teach you all that I know. Because you have already some confusions in your mind and you add my confusions to that and it will be a terrible big mess of confusions. I assure you I am the largest source of confusions in the world. Next only to Google. And third ground rule is that we are not going to cover the entire gamut of Shridhya. Only a few selections which we cover. Actually there is a concept of flipped classes where the study materials are given to the students beforehand. They are supposed to study at home. So the study happens at home. And what happens in the classroom is only discussions, questions and answers, where the guru is not the only person who answers all the questions. Peer to peer answers are also possible. In fact, that is a very important part of uh, learning. The first thing we got to do is to get the initiation into Sri Vidya, without which it does not make sense to practice the Sri Vidya. Like it or not, the Guru is an essential evil, you have to go through that. Because, you know, without paying the toll at the toll gate, you cannot enter the highway. The Guru is the toll gate through which you pass, you pay him Dakshina and enter the, the highway. The journey is your own. The Guru is there only to give an initial boost. So five percent of the job is done by the Guru at the beginning. Ninety percent of the job is done by you on your journey. And he kicks in again in the last five percent of the job. So ten percent is carried by the Guru, ninety percent is your own self-study. I see that there are a lot of faces coming from different cultures, different uh, countries and Sanskrit happens to be neither my language, not a language I understand, which I understand fully, nor is it a language which you understand fully. Unfortunately, most of the things that we are going to learn are in Sanskrit. I can't wish away that part of it. I can't. Sometimes, you know, it's difficult to translate these, uh, these words. Can you share this pan, please?
So it becomes difficult for you to pronounce sometimes how exactly to say the words. So there is a good way of saying things, the correct way of saying things, and a bad way of saying things. So I do not assume that the good is the enemy of the best. You may not be doing it the best way, but still, what you are doing is good enough. We accept that golden mean. So sixty percent, okay. Forty percent not okay is okay with me. It's okay. It should be okay with you too. So having covered these initial remarks, we'll go on to the initiation into the Sri Vidya. Sri Vidya is Brahma Vidya, the art of learning about yourself. You have one life to live and one body to live in. during that life. So, the body is also a necessary part of our uh, learning. There are switches in your body called the chakras. You put the switch on here and the light goes on there. The switch is not necessarily the place where the source of light is available to you. We have to recognize that. So when I tell you to touch a certain part of your body or activate or feel that energy flowing from there, please do not misunderstand me. I'm saying that I'm asking you to do some something bad. I am asking you to access the energies associated with that particular chakra or some. I think we are all adults and we understand that the whole of life is divided into three parts. First part consisting of three chakras is connected with creation. The second part is one chakra. This is sustained and nourished by my one chakra. And then the last three chakras led to understanding your relationship with the, the external world that you live in which you think is external to you and the ways to comprehend that externality and make it internal to you. So it's about communications, it's about time, it's about geometries, it's about mathematics, it's about logic and various other things. So Srishti, Stiti and Laya. Srishti is three chakras, Stiti is one chakra, and Laya is three chakras above. Three below, one in the middle, and three above. This is the, the structure of the things. There may be other mappings. I know there are many others. But we'll stick with one that we are all familiar with, more or less. And the Shivya, as given to me by my Guruji, Swami Saprakasha Ananda, Maharaj in Anakapalli is an Avadhuta, belonged to the Kaula tradition. Kaula means whole or total. Kula means total. Kul milke kitna hua. What is the total of all this? There are some people who wish to worship God as the the male principle, 
and some people worship God as a female principle. And uh, some people who say, but we want to worship God as male, want to worship God as female, want to worship God also as their union, which has the, the both male and female counterparts in one single entity. So Kaulas belong to this last tradition where they want the whole, they don't want to give up anything. I want this, this and that, all of them I want. So my Guruji, out of his infinite compassion, has given me a choice of mantras taken from seven crores of mantras which nobody can do in any lifetime. So he just given me some nine mantras. Seven to each represent one chakra and two more just in case. You know in the James Bond movie, he kills a person and he's uh, lying on the street and he puts an umbrella on top of him saying, just in case it rains. So in a similar way, just in case <laughs> something is passed in these six chakras, you still have some a spare to left. So let me first define in clear terms what exactly we mean by saying Muladhara, Aswaishtana, where they are located, the male and the female and you will understand the reason for explicitness. I don't want to hide behind a bush, literally. If you imagine a male and female in union, the srishti takes place because the seed comes out of the linga and enters the womb. The junction of the linga and the womb happens at the cervix. That's roughly where the Muladhara Chakra is located, both in the male and in the female. Because Trishti happens through the seed coming out and entering the womb, that junction. Actual creation takes place inside the womb for the female and the trigger for the seed to be a coming out is located in the region between the, the anus and the base of the lingam for the female in what is called the ejaculatory sphincter muscles. So even though the, the seed is delivered at the tip of the lingam, the activator is at the ejaculated spinter muscles and that's the location prescribed for the, the males. It's called between Gula and Linga Mola. That's the location of the Molahar Chakra. And Swadhisthana Chakra is the base of the Lingam and the entrance to the Vajayana in the male and the female respectively. They are the same place even when they are in union. And the force that drives the creation, the power that drives the creation is a desire. And desire is the nature of the second chakra. Desire is for anything, any desire. But explicitly it means the, the sexual desire which promotes procreation. Sex has got many functions. One is sacred function of uh, creating fresh life 
and that is the purpose of the nature itself, herself. She does not want to give up on life, she wants to continue it. And therefore, that is a sacred function. And our organs of sexuality are given by God for us to use for procreation and also for pleasure. In Hinduism, we do not decry karma, which is actually the pleasure. But we elevate it to status of a sacred end. We call it a third purushartha. In the dharma, artha, kama, moksha. In the third purushartha, we marry our daughters and sons because we want to procreate want to continue life. If we say that sex is sin, then we should not marry our daughters, we should not marry our sons, and the race will die. So, instead of associating sin with the, the desire, we associate sacredness with that. And that association removes the negativities and traumas associated with various kinds of suppressions and inhibitions. It is a natural way. In fact, it was the original cult of the entire human history, if you look. Whether you look for it in Greece, or whether you look for it in the Far East, or in Indian, or in Europe, or in America, or in Hawaii, wherever you go and look, you see the worship of the, the male and the female genitals as sacred, not something to be ashamed of, to be sin feel sinful about. And that is the source of all creation and creativity. You suppress that and the creativity evaporates. The source is there and its flowering takes place in different chakras. Having said that, we move on to the third chakra, the navel chakra, where the mother, the world is connected to the baby who is being created. The connection happens to the umbilical cord and that happens to the navel chakra. The first three chakras are connected with creation. The third chakra, the fourth chakra, the heart, where the baby is born does not know what is its food, how to ask for it. The mother pushes the nipple into the mouth of the baby and presses on her breast to express the milk and it flows into the, the baby and the baby learns to suck on that. It is connected with that tenderness, with love, with affection, with caring for people who do not know what to ask for and how to ask. They do not have the language, they do not have the expression. At that time, the mother takes care of the child. So the care is the fourth center, which is necessary for sustenance. And then the growth. The growth happens by understanding. Understanding happens by communications. The so communication is an important part. That is called Vishuddha Chakra, the neck chakra. The voice is formed through changing forms of the sound box through which the sound comes out. It's common at this point, but when it comes out of the sound box, the same sound is fed, but assumes different form by the way our tongue moves, our mouth is formed. So Sanskrit is one language which has gone deep into the acoustics of the phonemes that constitute the sound. It is divided into sounds that are produced by tongue touching the top of the palate, middle of the palate, end of the parrots and the teeth, the tip of the teeth 
and when their lips open, when their lips close. So it's based on very scientific understanding of how the structure of the sound is created and therefore it has got a lot of uh, sense to it. And they divided the Sanskrit alphabet into 15 wrong letters, consisting of eight groups of letters. They are called all the vowel sounds without which the consonants cannot be produced. And therefore they said, oh, that's like a corpse. And his life is there, the corpse cannot move. This is the corpses are these letters, ka, kha, ga, ga, na, cha, cha, ja, ja, nya, etc. And the vowels are the shiktis, the energies of life, which enable them to be pronounced even. So the, all the vowel sounds are called shiktis and all the consonants are called shivas. That's how they linguistically they are formed. And then they, so they about communications. If you want to communicate, you want to make yourself understood. You have to use some kind of a language, a symbol. This language is a very good thing. It's also a very bad thing. Combines people. When you go to a different country, you find a person speaking your own language like Spanish, you feel so happy. <coughs> but when it starts coming to divide people, it becomes very bad. You say the Muslims, they speak uh, Muslim uh, language and Christians speak English and they fight over linguistic language. We are fighting over language. So it's good and bad. So energy is always neutral. It's neither good nor bad. The intention which, which drives this energy may be good or bad. We say good when we create order and discipline and, uh, and love and growth. And we say bad when we start inhibiting the growth, when we create disparity and aggression and violence and stuff like that. So this choice is made. What is good, what is bad, depends upon your individual and choice partly, actually very little, and what the society says about good and bad, that rules. But these laws are changeable from place to place, from country to country, from region to region. They are not fixed laws. They change from time to time. But God made laws, nature's laws, they are invariant. They don't change with, this, with our culture. So, for example, time goes forward. It does not go back. So there are exceptions to that. But we may not go into that part of it. That takes us too far. There we are working with the, the boundary between the spirituality and the science. I don't want to work at that level right now. Maybe in some future classes, some advanced courses, we may start uh, touching on those subjects. I do not claim to be an expert in neither in spirituality nor in science. So I have the, I do not have the credentials to, uh, but some, anyway. The Sasra Chakra is uh, what we all believe in or what we all want to believe in, that we are all one. Even though we may be different, we have different genders, different shapes, different uh, life, the lives, like different characteristics, mm, different sizes, uh, different colors, but still all the expressions of one and the same entity and that is the common uh, life force, anima. So this is broadly about the chakras. The, the simplest to call them chakra 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. If you want to be more sophisticated, you can use for Moladhara, Svahishthana, Manipura, Anahata, Vishuddhi, Agnya, Sasrara. Well, 
Uh, now let's go into the mantras associated with each chakra. We are going to just consider only one mantra. As I said, they are constituted out of the, mm, the sounds, basic sounds, al al alphabets. I'll give a brief explanation of the nature of the mantras. First, let us talk, talk about Shreem. It consists of Sha, Ra, Im. E is the fourth letter, fourth sound in A, A, E, E, fourth letter. It represents the transcendental state, Thiriya. It's also called Mahagupta Sarasthata Bija. It is hidden rivers of flow called Sarasthatis, the seed of a flows of knowledge, Im. That's connected with the Sha. Sha is a symbol of auspiciousness and Ra is fire. An auspicious fire leading to an infinite expression of the flows of energies flowing in the cosmos. That's what the meaning of Shreem is. The shorthand form of the entire thing. Shreem is our goal. That's why we call it Shri Vidya. Auspiciousness, where everything is collapsed to a point. You can think of Shreem as collapsing the entire cosmos in a single point. It's Mahas Mahara. It eliminates all distinctions all attributes. It even kills Vishnu, Brahma, Shiva. It is that powerful and that is the center of this Vidya, means Antarmaka Sadhana. So that's why a stream is so important for us. Only there all of us become one. It's our goal, it's our aspiration that we reach the primordial state which is unchangeable, where there is no birth, there is no growth, there is no death. Punaravrtirahita prasthai namo namaha. We want to reach that state. That's why Shreem is that our goal that we all want to. It is the deepest goal and a goal where we do not feel that we are annihilated, we are still alive but attributeless. And Hreem is the opposite of this one. What Shreem does, Hreem undoes. If Shreem tries to collapse everything, and Hreem opens up everything, creates everything, it explodes the, the bindu, the point, into space and time. It creates an interval consisting of space and time in which the, the various Saraswatis, the Nadas, the, the flows of waves can take place. But something to move from here to there, you need a here and a there. Without a here and a there, nothing can move. What will move from where to where? Movement requires space, movement requires time. So the first creation must involve creation of space and time. And this creation of the pre-cosmic state of the universe is called Harim. It consists of three syllables. Ha, Ra, Im. Ha is the Shiva. Explosion of Shiva by fire, as fire. And Im again is the Mahagupta Saraswata Bija. And Hrim is so important that in, in creation, in preservation, and in reabsorption, that comes three times in this mantra of Devi. Once in the, as a Vagbhava Kota, in the face, once in the Kamaraja Kota, 
it is from the neck to the navel and third time below the navel. It is a, it comes as ichha, the desire to become many. The desire to procreate, jnana, establishing the knowledge base that is necessary for creation and kriya, actual manifestation. So I, J, K, ichha, jnana, kriya. So one says ichha, shakti, she manifests ka e e la hrim. And in the jnana shakti she is hazaka ha la hrim. And kriya shakti sakala hrim. And these are condensed into sim simple letters aim, clean and so. Aim is a desire to create. Clean is a knowledge to create. And so is the actual creation. So, Shreem, Hreem, I am clean, so. And Om is the name of God. Om is the name of Dattatriya. Om is the name of Ganapati. Pranavastarupa Vakravandam. It consists of three syllables. When you start saying Om, it opens out the mouth, A, U, M. A, you have to open your mouth to say A. And when you say U, then you have to say, make it around, open the lips, make it round, continue, L M, internalizes. The sound of U and M continue as the sound of uh, let us say a vena string be struck and then after striking, striking, then it continues as a sound. Where you cannot say it's am or im or um or arum, adum. So the initial part, the plucking is taken away. The remaining part is indistinguishable. It continues like that. So om is supposed to consist of five letters. A, O, M, and its continuation and termination. So five. They are called Sushti, Siti, Raya, Tirodhana, Anugraha. Sushti means creation, Siti means sustenance, Raya, A, O, M, and continuation, Tirodhana, and Anugraha, absence. It becomes zero, null, void, attributeless. So all these five syllables are contained in Om. We are normally told that it consists of three syllables. But Sri Vidya extends the research further and says, yes, it got five syllables. So let's all say these syllables. Om, Shreem, Hreem, Aim, Kleem, Sauh. They are the basic mantras that constitute all mantras of Sri Vidya. So please repeat after me. I'll say it only once because this is in sound form already. Aim, Hreem, Shreem, Aim, Kleem, Sauh, Hamsaha, Shivaha, Soham, Has, Kha, Prem, Ha, Saksha, Mala, Vara, Yom, Hasaum, Sahaksha, Ksha, Mala, Vara, Yim, Sahau, Swarupa, Nirupana, Hetave, 
స్వగురవ శ్రీ అన్నపూర్ణాంబ సహిత శ్రీ అమృతానంద నాథ శ్రీ గురు శ్రీపాదుకాం పూజయామి తర్పయామి నమ This is not one mantra, but many mantras. As you can see, that Ayam Hrim Shrim, it is a mantra of Lalita. It means, Ayam is Saraswati Bija, I am seeking knowledge. Hrim is the Bija of life. about creation, how this life is created, and knowledge about how life is created. And Shreem, how this life is going to be, become all one. So it is the mantra of Shri Vidya, I am Shreem, Shreem is the mantra of Shri Vidya. I am Kareem Sohu is the mantra of Rajashyamala, the power of attraction of everything into you, all the good into you. Again, they are Srishti, Siti and Laya. I am clean and so Srishti, Siti and Laya. Hamsaha, the breath. Outgoing breath is called Ha, ingoing breath is called Ha. Asa, Hamsaha. outgoing and ingoing breath, between them the life keeps oscillating, going out of you, getting into you. And every breath, the life is going in and out. The prana, prana vayu, oxygen, is coming through air, getting into your body and getting out of your body. Hamsaha. And that is Shivaha. Shivaha means Kalyana. It is for your good. And as long as breath is going in and out, It's good for you. Your life is preserved. And it says Soham. The same Hamsaha is also said as Soham. Soham is a full expansion of Om. You add So, S to O, Ha to Am, um, and Soham. or if you remove O from so, it becomes, if you remove so, S from so, it becomes O, and if you remove Ha from this, it becomes mm, Om. See the equivalence between these things, but it is a fuller expression of the breath going in and out. Saha or so means all that I see. Aham means I am. I am all that I see. That's the meaning of the word Soham. Hamsaha Shivaha Soham. And Haskha Frame. We are used to seeing the world from being inside our body and looking at it through the apertures that we call Jnana Indriyas. the sensory organs. You see, you hear, you taste, you smell, all these things are normal way we function. But we want to look at the world in a new way. We are used to seeing the world as Bahir Mukha, means looking outwards. But we want to see the world in the reverse way, Antar Mukha. Antar Mukha Samaradhyaya Bahir Mukha Sudhur Labha. She is easily appreciated if you can develop an Antar Mukha, looking inwards, which means I should become the world that I see and I say myself through that. What does that do to you? It is some strange thing. Number one, it removes your focus from yourself and shifts it to the world. 
you think of the world as a circle around you and you as a focus. You shift this, uh, the center from the center to the ring. It means you are not going to be worried about yourself, you are going to be worried about the all. Real spirituality consists in moving the focus away from yourself to others. That means your attention is more on the comforts, the quality of life of the, of the others, more than your own. When you become the world, you become an insignificant part of the whole. It matters little whether you exist, whether you are rich, whether you are poor, whether you are able to accomplish your visions or not. None of these things are important. Then you become the whole. So as you develop this vision of looking at yourself from outside to inside, what happens is that you are not becoming important, you are removing the, your self-importance, the self-importance. The concept of who I am, that disappears, even if get destroyed. And that is the best way to reach the Devi. That's why it's called Keshari Mudra. K means the space, Akasha. Chari means it moves. Your mind moves in the Akasha. It does not move inside your body. Today morning you have done what are called Pavan Mukta Asanas. And pavan can be understood to be a moving air or you can understand as moving prana. So the Mukta means free. Free in the movement of life forces within your body. That is meaning of Pavan Mukta. Asana means you are focusing your mind on a particular region to the exclusion of everything else. It's called Dharana. Dharana means holding on to. You are focused on something and only that thing is alive in your mind and everything else goes. When you are doing like this, this hand is not there. Your body is not there. Only that part is there. And you are activating the energies that are flowing there. You are becoming aware of that only. That's part of dharana. That's why you can achieve a lot of results with little effort. Yoga karma so kaushalam. Ability to achieve a lot of results with a little effort is called yoga. And uh, dharana aspect of yoga is concisely presented by our Kanya Kanchana as Pran Muktasana, maybe number one or two, I don't know. Which is a very, uh, it's a different way of doing uh, yoga. Uh, 